He looked exactly like he did then, but a bit taller. The soft face with small eyes and thin lips that always made him look younger than he actually was. Just a bit of five o'clock shadow that made him more grown up. Grinning, he dropped his duffel bag and opened his arms wide. Richie, how are you, man? Darren, his gritty voice so familiar, asked. I must have looked stoned because I just couldn't believe what I was seeing. I squeaked out a hello and I was quickly pulled into a hug. It was weird to think, but he even smelled the same as he did back then. Weed and pepperoni pizza. Darren being Darren, he rambled along about how long it's been and how much I've changed and I couldn't help but think. You died four years ago. Myself. Darren and two friends would always go into a nearby forest for camping trips between the ages of 12 and 15. They were just chances to get away from our parents, smoke weed, and, and eat a bunch of stuff without adults telling us off. None of us had much money, so our camping equipment was two kitty tents, stolen from our siblings or neighbors' yards, and a box of matches that we would use to make our own fire pit. We weren't totally stupid, we knew not to stray from pass, and we never went much more than a mile into the forest. There was a one mile marker, and before that, whichever way you wandered, you came out to a main road. Past the marker, it was thick, unforgiving woodlands that was almost impossible to find your way out of. Further than that was a disgusting swampland that stunk like rotten farts. Guess what we'd do? We would be cocky and dare each other to walk into the woodlands. Five minutes, then ten, then thirty. The triumphant would come swaggering out to all that wasn't scary. Only idiots could get lost. You could probably guess we were idiots. Due to a peculiar week of warm weather in mid-November, we decided it would be fun to go camping. Covered in winter coats and snow boots and thick thermal socks, we got to the one mile marker and before setting up, one friend, Jimmy, said, let's go deeper. I heard rangers were going around rounding up people. I ain't going home because of some forest security guard. Agreeing, we went past the one mile marker. I can't be sure, but I'd say we were three miles deep past the marker. The woodlands was incredibly crowded. We had to climb over a lot of huge ground broken roots to finally find a flat clearing for our tents. It really wasn't too scary, just darker than the other areas. We set up, lit some blunts, and chowed down on a bunch of chips and two day old pizza. Nothing happened until late into the night. The tents were small, but we could fit two people in each. Jimmy and Marcus went in one, Darren and I in the other. We soon fell asleep, probably about 11 p.m. My phone buzzed at about 1 a.m., which woke me up as it was under my face, with a message from my dad, drunk texting to see if I'm all right. Delirious from sleep, I just touch it to turn the harsh screen light off. Just before the light went off, I noticed a silhouette on the tent. It went off too fast to see what it was properly and with my brain still in night mode, I touched the phone to get light again. The silhouette didn't shift, but I saw it properly then. It crouched down. I guess it didn't notice the light coming through the tent, and I saw how long its legs were. Like five foot long sticks. Its arms were similar, swinging as it crouched. It pressed its long finger onto the tent and it made that horrid scraping noise. I kept as quiet as I could, if it was a ranger, they would have started banging on the tents and announcing themselves. I turned the light off again and turned to face Darren. Outside the tent came the sound of leaves and sticks crushing underfoot. The person was sneaking around. The sound was so careful and quiet. They didn't want to be heard. I began to get those shakes you get when you're really cold and really anxious. I tried to whisper to Darren to wake up but pretty sure he had a pocket knife on his body somewhere. I thought it would come in handy with this freak checking our tents out. I whisper through my teeth, Darren, wake up! But the guy was a heavy sleeper. 
I almost pissed myself when I heard the zipper of the tent begin to pull. The person was trying to open it. Carefully, though. They were trying hard to stay quiet. They were gently tugging the zipper, but they wouldn't figure out which way it went. Finally, the zipper came down, and I kept my eyes closed tight, but I was shaking like a leaf. I opened my eyes a slit to see what was there. A hand, black and thin, crept in. Extremely slow, this hand did not twitch, but hovered further into the tent, over the feet of Darren's sleeping bag. Before I could nudge Darren to wake him up, this hand clenched hold of Darren's ankles and pulled him out of the tent. Darren instantly began screaming, and so did I. I tried to grab a hold of Darren before he disappeared through the tent's opening. He was pulled out so fast. The tent rolled over, but I finally managed to get out to see Darren being dragged into the woodlands besides the clearing. He was covering his face from those twigs and shrubs he was being pulled into, screaming and crying to help him. Jimmy and Marcus's faces appeared from the tent with worried looks. I yelled at them that something had taken Darren and they looked at one another with hesitant faces. They thought it was a joke. I grabbed my boots, forgetting my coat, and ran in the direction Darren was dragged. Jumping over a small tree trunk and losing balance, I got hit in the face with a branch. I panicked as a liquid sprayed on me from the leaves of a branch. It stunk of copper. But I just rubbed my face and continued in a straight line. I could hear Jimmy and Marcus following me, asking me to stop and that it wasn't funny. I sprinted as fast as I could, taking a beating from the branches and roots that got thicker and thicker the further I went. I was shouting Darren's name, and soon, Jimmy and Marcus did the same, but we got no reply. Five minutes of running through thick nature brought me to another clearing, bigger than where our tents were, with a large tree in the center. There was a little bit of moonlight to see. It was a clearing, but nothing else was clear. Jimmy luckily grabbed his flashlight before he began following me. When he put the light on me, he and Marcus jumped, as the light showed a splash of blood all over me. My face and clothes everywhere was covered in splatters. That's what was on the branches. I began to cry as I tried to rub the blood off of me. Jimmy took the light off me, and with a worried look, followed something on the ground. What is it? Marcus asked. Jimmy pointed to the ground. A trail of blood ran from the woodlands through the clearing and up the large tree in the center. We all followed the light as Jimmy moved it along the trail. It covered most of the bark and curled around the trunk. We peeked around the tree and the blood stopped on the trunk. Marcus looked further around the trunk when a droplet of blood fell onto his forehead, and then another, and another. He looked up and began screaming. Darren's body, his eyes still open but blank, was slung over a thick branch. I told Jimmy to keep the light on us as I tried to get him down. I pulled his arm and his body came down like a sack of bricks. I think we all knew he was dead there and then, but we just didn't want it to be true. Darren landed on his belly and we saw that his back had been ripped to shreds. There was no flesh there. His shirt had been ripped off clean. All of his muscles and organs were all mushed around. His spine was severed too. We all just cried. There wasn't much else we could do. After a long time sitting next to his body, the sun was beginning to rise. We didn't say much, but we agreed we'd have to get back to the tents and call someone. Our parents, the rangers, and Darren's parents. I pet Darren's hair before I stood up. He was my best friend and I had to leave him there. If I had just shook him awake when that thing was outside the tent, he probably would still be alive. As we began to leave the clearing, the sound of a squelching came from behind. We all spun around and saw that thing, holding Darren's body. It was tall, maybe seven feet, and thin, and all black. Its eyes were wide and sunken. I can't remember much else as it quickly ran into the woodlands with Darren's body. Jimmy and Marcus had to restrain me from running after it. 
They basically dragged me, kicking and screaming back to the tents. When we got there, two rangers were there checking out our tents, and their faces switched from annoyed to shocked when they saw us, covered in blood and crying. Darren's body was never found. His parents were distraught. He had a younger brother, and that kid was never the same. Went from fun and bouncy to just there. He just drifted day to day. Two years after his death, Darren's family moved down south and we never heard from them again. The rangers and police believed we didn't do anything, but they didn't believe our monster story. Most likely, a wolf. Shock can make you think crazy things. It's not their fault, one officer said behind our backs. Jimmy, Marcus, and I stayed friends but basically ended contact when we finished high school. We never spoke about Darren again. But now, in the flesh, Darren was chatting away to me in the doorway of my dorm. I asked him into my room. My roommate hadn't arrived yet so I thought we could get some privacy to talk. The way he spoke and acted, he was so comfortable around me, like the last time I saw him was yesterday. He sat down on the bed opposite mine and continued talking. I don't know what he was talking about, but I stopped him and took some time to come up with what I wanted to ask him. Darren, how are you here? I asked. What do you mean? He laughed. I did good in high school, just like you. I shook my head. No, Darren, do you remember four years ago? Darren was smiling, but his eyes went blank. Yeah, we were in freshman year. Do you remember our camping trips? I said. His smile faded as he looked around the room, as if trying to find an answer. Yeah, we'd smoke and eat junk. Darren, I trailed off. What was I supposed to say? Oh, dude, you died. Don't you remember? Man, what fun times. On one of those trips, you were, uh, attacked, and your body was never found. Darren gave me a totally blank look and grinned. The grin was a genuinely happy smile. In a flash, the grin dropped and he looked sullen. I moved away that summer, never went on any camping trips. He wouldn't look at me now. We sat in silence for some time before he stood up and grabbed his bag. He was breathing really quickly, his chest going up and down fast. Dude, are you alright? I have to go, Darren muttered, looking at his feet. I stood, but he quickly shuffled to the door and left. The door swung shut behind him, and by the time I opened it and looked up and down the dorm's halls, he was nowhere to be seen. People were still moving in the dorms. Hey! Did any of you see the guy that just left? I asked a small crowd. A few stopped and shook their heads at me. I feel like I've gone crazy. I have no explanation for what just happened. Two days ago, I packed for my first camping trip. And even though I've been a little nervous, I was also excited. Camping is in quotations because I know a lot of you won't consider staying in a cabin in the woods to be camping. I get that, but I'm a city girl. I was born in one of the largest cities in the world and I've lived my entire life there. The most time I've ever spent amongst nature was picnicking in Central Park. So to me, spending 10 days in a secluded cabin in the middle of the woods is basically camping. My boyfriend, Ryder, on the other hand, has been camping his entire life. I was the first to notice an extra person had joined our group. I counted six of us sitting around the campfire, but I knew we had left home with five. The sixth person had joined us somewhere along the way, but where and when exactly, I could not be sure. All the glowing faces looked familiar, like I had known them all for a lifetime. That was why it took so long to find the man out of place. I had to go through the faces one by one. I went through my history with them, recounting how I met them, how I know them. I fit each one into my memories like 
puzzle pieces. First, there was Mark. He was sitting next to Sarah, chatting her up as always. I met Mark and Sarah six years ago in the 10th grade. Mark and I played wide receiver together on the high school football team. Sarah was a cheerleader, and Mark always had a thing for her. The three of us started hanging out after games, Mark flirting non-stop, and Sarah always hilariously rebucking him after a while. Then there was Ben. We had been best friends since the first grade, inseparable ever since we bumped heads playing tag during recess. He had his arm around his longtime girlfriend, Justine. She started at her school when she moved from Chicago in the seventh grade. Ben sat next to her in English, and soon she became a part of our group at the time. She was quiet and shy when she first arrived, but once we got to know her, she opened up. She was one of the coolest and nicest people you ever got to meet. She had also become close with Sarah in the past few years, and then there was the six face. The piece that did not fit. I stared at him, and his name escaped me. That is, if I ever had it in my memory banks in the first place. He looked familiar, but I could not place him in my memories. But why, if I recognized him, could I not remember his name? Why did he sit among us, acting as if he belonged? He stared at Mark and Sarah as they chatted. He laughed when they laughed, smiled when they smiled. I couldn't figure it out. The question burned in my head. How had he, a stranger, joined our little group without any of us noticing something amiss? Yo, Porter! Ben pulled me from my thoughts. Your head up in the clouds or something? I was just telling Justine about our fifth grade teacher. What was his name again? Mr. Smith, I said. Oh yeah, Mr. Smith. I was telling Justine how you could rile that guy up like nobody else. Remember that time you handed in an assignment printed in yellow ink? Ben and Justine laughed. Yeah, I remember, I said. I can still see the steam coming out of his ears. They laughed again and I joined in half-heartedly. When I glanced, the strange man's way, he was watching us, grinning. He was always watching, always on the periphery, never partaking. Part of the reason he had flown under the radar. I was struck with the sense that he was studying us. My skin crawled. Ben drained his beer and threw the empty can in the cooler. Well, I gotta take a leak, he said, and walked into the woods, swallowed up by the dark. You really know how to push people's buttons when you want to, huh? Justine said. I shrugged. I was having trouble focusing on the conversation. The weight of the situation, the reality of it, was starting to hit me. The strange man had attached himself to our group unnoticed, and who the hell knew what his motivations were? Questions raced through my mind. None I could answer. How had no one else noticed yet? Why had it taken me so long to notice? Was I going insane? Did I have amnesia? And forget this one friend of ours. What in the hell was going on here? The strange man stood with jerkiness. I gotta take a leak, he said. It was the first time I heard him talk. He spoke with an odd lisp. It sounded as if he had to force the words from his throat. He walked with an awkward gait, and like Ben, disappeared behind the dark veil of the trees. No one else flinched. Justine kept talking. I always loved the long relationship you and Ben have. It was so hard moving cities and leaving all my old friends behind. I mean, I can't complain too much. I wouldn't have met Ben and all you guys otherwise. Justine, don't you see what's going on here? Huh? You're telling me you haven't noticed? Notice what, Porter? What are you talking about? Who was that guy? I gestured to the vacated spot the strange man left behind. Oh, him? He's a... Uh... She trailed off. She frowned into the fire. I could see her mind ticking over, and her eyes twinged with concern. I knew I wasn't going crazy. I don't know, she said. Who is it? 
That's what I'm trying to figure out. We stared at each other. Maybe Justine was cut off. An ear-piercing screech came from the woods. It sounded like a shrill, injured cat. A large cat. The sound split the air and cut our conversation short. A blanket of silence fell over the four of us. Only the crackling campfire persisted. The woods was still and quiet. The hell was that? Mark broke the silence. I don't know, Sarah said. I've never quite heard an animal like that before. Sounded like some screwed up mountain lion, Justine said. You ever heard anything like that, Porter? I shook my head. My fingers tingled with adrenaline. Ben was still in the woods, and the strange man was out there with him. Dread filled my gut. There's no mountain lions out here, Mark said. It's probably an elk. They can make some creepy sounds. Sarah agreed. Justine bit her lip and scanned the woods. It's probably okay. I think Mark's right, I said to her, but I wasn't sure I believed it. Mark and Sarah had started up the conversation again when the strange man bumbled out of the woods. They paid him no mind. I was hoping something would have triggered in them by now, but they were oblivious. The strange man took a beer from the cooler. He fumbled with it, struggling with the tab. It was as if he had never opened a can before. When he finally had it open, he sat, beer in hand, and continued to watch Mark and Sarah. A thin smile on his face. He never did take a sip. I watched him from across the campfire, his head wavering behind the heat. I touched on what made me uneasy about the strange man. Aside from the fact he had managed to infiltrate our group without any of us noticing for a long time, he moved with jerkiness and awkwardness, like a newborn animal. Nothing he did was smooth or well-practiced. It made everything he did look like an act, an imitation. I didn't make the connection at the time, but I should have seen this man was not quite human. But at the moment, I wasn't sure what to think. I guess I thought he was just a freak. I considered calling him out, then and there. I wanted to ask him just what the hell he was doing. But I'll admit, I was scared. I had visions of this guy being some horrific serial killer, and I didn't know how dangerous he was, or if he was armed. I didn't want to push him into doing something drastic that got us all killed. His time went by without any sign of Ben. I became convinced the strange man had done something to him. I watched him plotting, planning, and marking his next target. Anger sprouted from my fear, and I started to see red. I needed to stop him. We used an axe to chop firewood for our campfire, and it was leaning against my seat. This man was dangerous. I was sure of it. I convinced myself... I needed to do something before another one of us was next. I clutched the axe's handle. The smooth wood felt reassuring in my hand. Justine touched my arm. Porter, where's Ben? I'm getting nervous. It's okay. I lied, patting her hand. I'm sure everything is okay. I stood with axe in hand. I'm gonna go get some more firewood. I announced more awkwardly than I hoped. Uh, all right, dude, Mark said. Porter. Justine's voice wavered. Speaking up was a mistake. I had drawn the attention of the strange man. I walked past him, trying to act as nonchalant as possible, but I was never a good actor. He watched me the whole way. He maintained his glare as I reached the perimeter of the woods, and as he looked back, his head rotated around an unnatural distance. This was enough to chill my spine. I was hoping he would turn around to look away and give me an opening, but he never did. I'm not exactly sure what happened next. I never saw him stand up and walk over to me. I never even saw him move a single muscle. But in an instant, he was standing in front of me, inches away from my face, as if he teleported. A metallic smell stung my nose. The strange man stunk of blood and copper. 
The axe trembled in my hand. Any thought of actually using it fled my mind. I locked into place, my skin covered in goosebumps. Power radiated off him. He spoke to me. Get some firewood, he said in his forced tone, and he smiled wide. At that moment, Ben emerged from the woods. Ben, Justine cried. Jesus, Ben said as Justine squeezed him. Did you guys hear that cat thing? We think it was an elk, Mark said. Where were you? Why did you take so long? Justine asked. I guess I wandered too far off and I lost sight of the campfire. It took me a bit to find my way back. For a second, I thought I was going to have to freeze my butt off out there, alone tonight. The relief washed over my body like a wave, crashing into my muscles. I felt each one relax. At least Ben was safe. I looked for the strange man, but he was gone. He somehow slinked away, while I was distracted. He was good at going undetected when he wanted to. My thoughts turned to getting out of there, even though Ben was unharmed. That guy was still in trouble. I started back towards the group and caught the middle of their conversation. I don't know, actually. Yeah, who was that guy? Ben said. I thought he was with you guys. Sarah said. Yeah, isn't he your friend? Mark added. I thought he drove over with you three. No, Ben said. I don't know who he is. The panic spread over everyone's faces. They were finally feeling what I was feeling. The realization had set in. We need to get out of here, I said. Before he comes back. Yes, please, Justine said. We have to leave now. That guy was a freak, right, Porter? Yeah, I said. I explained to them how I noticed he was the odd man out when we were sitting around the fire. I explained the odd behavior, and they all agreed the guy was strange and possibly dangerous. None of us could pinpoint exactly when he had joined the group. He had slipped in unnoticed and unaccounted for. It was uncanny. We packed our tents in record time. We trekked for 15 minutes to our cars through dark woods, flashlights in hand. We heard the screech of the elk again, if it was an elk, which I have my doubts about now, and we took some comfort from the fact it sounded farther away. Even so, we picked up our pace for the final stretch of the walk. I felt like I could finally relax behind the wheel and lock doors in my SUV. Justine and Ben sat in the back while Mark and Sarah followed behind in Mark's beaten up Ford Laser. We were heading out of the woodland and we were planning to shack up in a motel for the night before heading home in the morning. I thought we were free and clear. We wound our way around the dark roads that snaked through the woods. I let a smile open up on my face when we finally reached the exit road. It was an arrow straight stretch of asphalt that split through the last few miles of woodland. I pressed on the accelerator. I couldn't wait to get the hell out of there. And I think Mark was feeling the same way. But he sat close on my rear bumper. I remember thinking, at least we'll have a strange tale to tell after all this. I didn't think it was about to turn into a horror story. The trees and the dashed lines on the road blurred past us. My headlights reached out for the seemingly endless road and my speedometer needled its way towards 100 miles per hour. I don't know what possessed me to go that fast, and I wish Mark didn't follow my lead. It was a mistake. A strange man appeared from behind a tree. He walked into the middle of my lane. I slammed the brakes, but it was too late. The next sequence of events happened so fast, it plays like a slideshow in my mind. The tires screeched, and there was a smell of burning rubber. The strange man folded over my bonnet and got sent flying down the road. He skated across the pavement on his back, moving with such speed it looked as if he was gliding on ice. More tire screeching. Mark flew past in the opposite lane, fishtailing. He fought it, and for a moment I thought he had it saved, but the car hooked right into the trees. The sickening sound of crunching metal reverberated in the air. Mark's car slammed into a tree, driver's side first, sending fragments of glass and metal flying. 
The car bounded off one tree and into another. The front passenger side impacted this time. The front light exploded, and the passenger side cavity caved in, sending a wheel bouncing into the, sending a sending a wheel bounding into the woods. The crumpled heap of a car came to a rest. Justine was the first out the door, crying out Sarah's name. Ben went after her, and I followed after him. Everything felt surreal as shock coursed through my body. It was as if I was watching through a screen. I floated over the asphalt as Justin and Ben sprinted towards the steaming wreckage. The crash scene dimly lit by my SUV's one remaining headlight. There are two screams I'll never forget. They imprinted themselves on my brain, and I'll hear their echoes at night forever if I happen to get Alzheimer's later in life. I know the last thing to go will be these screams. The first one I heard when I was 13, it came from my mother. The first one I heard when I was 13, it came from my mother. It flooded the house, splashing off the walls. I ran out of my room to see her crumpled at the front door, with two police officers standing by. They had notified her that her oldest son, my brother, had died. The second came from Justine when she saw what was waiting for us in that Ford laser. Mark was unrecognizable. He was a shattered mess of bone, skin, and blood, melded and intertwined with the crumpled steel. Sarah was blinking slowly, her breathing labored, her one arm shattered, broken in too many places to count, her legs crushed at knees from the front of the car which crumpled back into her leg space. Her legs would have been flat if I could see them. Justine turned away and fell to her knees, face buried in her hands, shoulders heaving. Ben tried to comfort her, but he had to turn away and throw up off the side of the road. I pulled out my phone and struggled to dial 911. With my fingers shaking, I kept pressing the wrong numbers. My voice was small and distant as I explained what happened to the operator. She told me to stay on the line, but as I looked down the road, I dropped my phone. The strange man was standing there. His grin reached from ear to ear, showing a grand stand of teeth. His shoulders shrugged up and down as if he were laughing. In fact, he was laughing. If I were not in shock, I would have gone after him right there and then. I would have torn his heart, if he had one, right from its chest. But all I could do was stare, mouth agape, struggled to keep the tears behind my eyes. The strange man started for the woods. I watched him go, and I watched him change. I saw it. I know I did. There was no illusion, no trick of the mind. This was real. I saw him shapeshift. I saw its true form. We were not dealing with something human that night. After countless hours of research, I believe what I saw, what others have called the Goat Man. Its horns stuck out unevenly from its head, its grinning snout barred rows of sharp teeth, and walking upright like a man with an awkward gait, it vanished into the shrouded woods. It has been eight months since that night. I've only seen my friends a handful of times since then. Our relationships have shattered and are left in ruin. All we are now to each other is a stark reminder of that night. Mark is dead. Sarah survived, but is a triple amputee. Justine and Ben broke up. And here I am, rugged, with a scraggly beard and uncut hair after spending every sleepless night researching that monstrosity I saw that night. The Goat Man. I'm going back to those woods. So help me God. I'm going back. I'm coming for the goat man, and I'm not stopping until one of us is dead. When I was eight years old, my best friend, Stan and I would take a road trip with his parents out to their 130 acre ranch in the small town of Cody, Wyoming, where they raised a few horses. The house, stable, fenced in area where the horses could roam. A couple other small buildings only took up about a fifth of the entire plot of land they owned. Stan and I's favorite thing to do when we spent the week out there was to set both our tents way out in the middle of the field, far enough away that 
you couldn't see any other buildings. We would stock up on water, soda, candy, hot dogs, s'mores, and everything else you would need for a perfect kid's survival week. We set up our tents about 20 yards about 20 yards apart and built the fire in the middle of our tents as it started to get dark. Survival day one was coming to an end. We tried to avoid using any electronics or technology of any kind to make it a true survival week. Instead of walkie talkies, we decided to try the old tin can and piece of string communication device. We had two empty aluminum cans that once held tomato paste and about 80 feet of white string. I used a nail to punch a tiny hole in the bottom of each can so I could feed the string through the bottom and knot it from the inside to avoid it from pulling through. By this time, it was pitch black outside except for the dwindling fire. We each took a can and carried it with us into our own tents, zipping up the tent door behind us while leaving a small opening at the bottom for the string to pass through. We tested it by making typical eight-year-old jokes and then said goodnight. Our tin can communication device worked better than expected. Exhausted from setting everything up and feeling confident that we were true survivalists, we fell asleep almost instantly. Your fire is bright, softly spoke an unknown voice. This sudden break in silence woke me halfway up and all I could respond with was, What was that, Stan? Your fire is bright. Now wide awake and sitting bolt upright. I realized this wasn't Stan speaking in the other can. The soft voice spoke as if it was genderless. It was neither a man's voice nor a woman's. In a panicked yet stern tone, I asked, where's Stan? I sent him home. It's just you and me now. Why are you in his tent? Who are you? I questioned in a shaky voice. In an almost amused tone, the unknown voice replied with a simple, who said I'm in his tent. Completely frozen in fear, I heard the sound of footsteps outside my tent. Every rational and sensible bone in my body. Completely frozen in fear, I heard the sound of footsteps outside my tent. Every rational and sensible bone in my body tried to warn me not to look, but I couldn't help it. I slowly turned my head to the right side of my tent and my eyes soon followed. Pressed deep into the canvas of my tent was an outline of a face. All I could make out was where the eye sockets were. I sat silently, holding my breath for what felt like hours. The unknown face pressed firmly, staring straight forward, didn't move an inch or even blink, if it could blink, until I couldn't hold my breath any longer. As soon as I let in a tiny bit of air through my nose, the face jerked immediately in my direction looking directly at me and made an ungodly sound while violently clawing at the side of the tent. Adrenaline kicked in full throttle at this point. Unzipping the front door to my tent, I bolted the 20 yards to Stan's tent, somehow managing to unzip his door, dive in, and re-zip it within mere seconds. Stan, scared half to death, asked what the hell was going on. By the time I was finished telling the story of my night surviving pure terror, the sun had risen. We climbed out of Stan's tent to check our campfire. To my surprise, and Stan's lack of surprise, nothing was disturbed. That was, until I spotted the string that had connected the two cans that had been laid across the middle of the fire all night long. Stan commented on how I wasn't responding at all last night, so we finally gave up and went to sleep. As for me, I spoke to something, and the other end didn't connect to Stan's aluminum can. It connected directly to something unknown, something I hoped to never have contact again. Thank you so much for watching, I really appreciate it. And also, big thanks to my patrons, and if you want to support me, the link to my Patreon is in the description below. Thank you so much, and have beautiful nightmares.